I'm Bill Humphreys. Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. Today we have a, uh, a special guest with us, someone who has been uh, well received nationally and internationally for her work in making beads. Christina Logan, who received the Spotlight Award last April in Glass and Ceramics. Uh, well, we, wel we welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, I am happy to be here. Thank Excellent. You. Glass and Ceramics. I, I took a look at your website and I was fascinated by the different ways in which you were manipulating glass. Mm -hmm. And it goes from very small items such as uh, beads or beads and or buttons, I would imagine mm -hmm. they could be used for such, all the way up to larger items including teapots. Yes. Can you talk to me a little bit about how expansive the world of sculpture in glass the world in sculpture and glass is very expansive. Um, but what I do, it's interesting that you say that it looks like there's a wide range of techniques. But primarily, my technique is flame working or working with a torch. Uh, it's also you, it, the word is also flame working, um, torch working. Basically, I use cold glass like the rods here. Mm -hmm. And I have a torch. My particular torch is oxygen and propane driven. Mm -hmm. And I melt this glass. Mm -hmm. And then I wrap it around for, for making glass beads. I will then wrap it around a stainless steel rod. And I'll build my bead up on this stainless steel rod so that afterwards, when I take that bead off, let's use this bead right here, I'll have a hole. So that's how those beads are created. I see. So I'm a flame worker. So I don't use a furnace full of hot glass. I'm not a glass blower. If I'm using pieces and making larger objects, mm -hmm. the other technique that I use is a lost wax casting technique. It's also known as pâte de verre. It's an old French word for paste of glass. So I'm using the glass in this form. Can so you... those, those are the two ways that I'm working with glass. Can you explain to us, this, uh, this looks like um, uh, amber, looks like, mm -hmm. I, I kind of expect to see a, a dead fly in the middle of yes, it or something yes. like that. Um, can you explain to us a little bit about the process of building up, as, as, um, as I saw in some of the videos that you had on your website, uh, there's the, the, the creation of a bead such as the one you were just holding, mm -hmm. is a process of building up, of layering? It is, and, and that's the process that I like so much. Um, I will begin, for instance, this bead, which is dark in the center. It looks like it's black, mm -hmm. but it's a, it's a transparent cobalt blue. If you were to look through the light, you'd see that it's cobalt. So I start with my cobalt glass, mm -hmm. and I build that shape, that barrel shape, any shape that I want. So I take my time building that. And then afterwards, in order to create this decoration on the surface, I take another color and I'll melt that over the flame. And it's very much like um, if you ever played with candle wax when you were a yeah, kid yeah, or an so. adult. You yeah. know, you, you take the little piece <laughs> off and then you melt the wax and the yeah. flame. It's yeah. pretty much how the glass works. So I melt it and um, it will stay raised as a bump like this uh -huh. if I don't heat it that much. If I heat these dots a lot, they'll spread out and melt into the surface of the glass. So I'll just keep on adding and adding and adding and adding until I get the decoration that I want. Now, just real quick to, yeah. to, to ask, this particular bead here um, has a decoration on the surface of it that, right. it that appears to be flat in its, in its texture. Right. If we take a look at this one, though, it's raised in its texture, but what is underneath it seems to be transparent to another layer. Correct. So you have to think backwards. So first I made that layer, in this case, that salmon color, which is opaque. And then I laid over the top of that a transparent clear. Okay. And then over the transparent clear, put those opaque green dots, green dots on, top. on top of that. So it's layering. And I like to layer opaque, transparent, opaque, tra transparent. Some people who see these patterns, mm -hmm will ask me if they're an Italian technique called millefiori, which is pre-making the canes ahead of time and then snipping them off and then adding them. 
but it's not. It's all just surface work. It's like um, cake decorating or painting. Uh -huh. It's just adding and adding and adding and adding. And, make, and layering up until you achieve the... Exactly. The so layering a transparent yeah. and then an opaque and then a transparent and an opaque. Sometimes I'll take a little metal pick or a tool mm -hmm. and I'll pull or I'll stretch those dots so they become triangles. Mm -hmm. um, but most of it is just layering color on color on color and color. Nice. Now, talk to us a little bit about it, this particular style here, if you would. You were talking about it being la lost wax. wax casting. Casting. Can you explain a little bit about how that takes place? I, first of all, there, it's interesting. It's almost like a, like a math Geom ge um, geometry problem, because I, I go from the positive image to the negative image many times in this process. Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, I create this image in wax. So the positive image, this container, the bottom of it and the top of it, I create that in wax. By crafting it. By, by crafting it. By right? sculpting the wax. There are different ways that I can create it. If mm -hmm. I need to have multiples, then I can make a rubber mold in order to pour the wax. But basically, you just need to think that I make this, I carve this in wax mm -hmm. to begin with. After that's carved in wax, I pour over it a plaster material that also has silica in it that I can then put into the kiln later. So I pour over it this plaster material and then I'll melt out the wax, I steam out the wax. So then if I turn over my plaster material, I have an empty negative space that used to be my object where the wax is melted out. So that's where the term lost wax comes from. And that, that negative space then has the ridges and the design? In this case, it does not have the ridges because I, cr I carved those after when oh, the I glass see. was cold. Okay. But it could have the ridges. Yeah. So you create a, basically you create a negative that then by pouring glass or creating glass on the inside yep. creates the positive image. Exactly. So in that negative space, that plaster that has the wax that's been melted out, I put this crushed glass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this can be crushed even finer. Like I can put um, really fine silt almost glass in there mm -hmm. to create different color mm -hmm. changes. Mm -hmm. Or I could use bigger chunks. Mm -hmm. So this glass then gets put on the top and then I put that whole unit into a kiln. And then it slowly heats up, and then it slowly cools down over days, yeah. sometimes. Nice. I have to walk away. <laughs> and then I uh, open the kiln, and then I break away that mold. And when I break away that mold, I get the treasure on the inside. Gotcha. And sometimes the treasure needs a lot of work and grinding. Like in this case, I, I did that grinding and polishing of the surface. Mm -hmm. um, that's how these are created, too. This surface has been polished and you can kind of see the interior is a mat, and yeah. so that's how it came out of the mold. This is going to be a goblet or a ch covered chalice uh, that will have a stem that will have beads on it. It'll be similar to the candlestick. It'll be similar yeah. to the candlestick, and then a bead on the top of it. Yeah, similar to this one here, which yeah. does have the bead on top. And that lid opens up. Yeah, nice. This is, this is destined to be a chalice as well. That will too. Yeah. Yep, yeah, it'll be, um, again, beads for the stem, and then I'm going to have a bronze foot mm -hmm. on the bottom. Mm -hmm. But this is the work that I worked on uh, when I was a resident at the Corning Museum of Glass two months ago. Oh, that was just recently, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's great. Is that the video that is on your website now, the, the current one? The current one that's on the, um, my website now was created by Corning, mm -hmm. but it was created a couple years ago. Okay. Uh, and I'll be shooting for them next year as well, a video that is more how-to, which will be great for people who want to get into making beads. It will give them foundations yeah. of how to begin on your own. So if we step back a little bit to, yeah. the, to the beginning of your whole interest in this particular, how, how, did, how did you start this, this desire to create beads, to work with glass, to... It was... Um, uh, when I, I went to the University of New Hampshire, mm -hmm. so I'm a UNH grad, and I got my fine art degree there. But at the time, I was carving sculptures out of wood. Out of school, I ran into a glass artist by chance, and I worked for a glass artist for four years. So that was after school. I knew nothing about glass. And um, from that experience, I got to see glass being created on a really large scale. I think I got part 
to be part of um, architectural installations oh. and having glass shipped all over the world. Wow. And I saw somebody one night working on a flame all by themselves. And I thought, that was the first time I saw that you could actually melt glass by yourself, because I had seen it on this huge scale. Uh -huh. And so I started making beads, because I've always been in love with the culture and the history and the connection to other peoples throughout the world with beads. So it was sort of a chance that I knew about glass, and I had this love of beads. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of started at the time before anybody really, it was at the beginning of the contemporary glass bead movement. Gotcha. That is, it's a very interesting thing. It happens in, in almost every discipline in the, in the arts, but uh, I never stop to think about how culture of a country or culture of a people starts to reflect itself and become noticeable in, the, in a glass object. Right. Um, which I mean, happens in pottery as well, right. and happens in drawing and sketching exactly. as well, and so forth and so forth. What, were there any particular countries or um, uh, cultures that you've mm. encountered that it's it, that inspire me yeah it, um, I've always looked at when I was just selling beads in the beginning I would just sell individual beads you know now I'm making objects and jewelry and finished work but in the beginning I made very modest sized beads and I would sell them so I would go to all the bead trade shows and one of the largest ones is in Tucson in February mm -hmm. And I was always fascinated by the African dealers who would come because many of those beads in the 1800s and 1900s were made in Venice. Oh. So many of the beads were made in Venice and then traded to Africa. And a lot of those beads were flame worked. So I would always look at the, the designs and the shapes and how those beads were created. And then it was fascinating to me how the, the story of beads being a monetary exchange you know, would travel through the world. Interesting. And though they might be made in one country, they're desired in another country. Yeah, yeah. You know, for different reasons. You know, they might be made for monetary reasons, but then they might be used for religious reasons gotcha. afterwards. Gotcha. So they have different importance. Um, and then these shapes, for instance, um, are not from a glass bead. These are inspired by um, granite beads. African granite beads that I have seen. So um, that's where that shape came from. Fascinating. Fascinating. We have, um, we have some still photographs of uh, the work that, it, that you have done in the past. And I'd like to, to uh, ask if we could put those up on the screen here and we'll take a look at, if you could just describe what we have here. Those are beads. Those are uh, <clears throat> beads on top of beads. So the, the larger ones have uh, holes that are probably a half an inch in um, diameter, and then on set on top is another bead, so they look really very ornate. Interesting. But those are beads on beads. They're about two and a half inches across mm -hmm. total. Mm -hmm. Again, another shot. I call them floral beads, and they're beads that have developed over the years. I've been making beads for about 20 years, and these are a culmination of many of the styles brought together in this single bead. Mm. Here is one of those large beads. It's probably about two inches across. And then it's set in sterling silver. It's a brooch. So the final brooch ends up being about two and a half inches across. It can be worn as a, a coat pin, a lapel pin, or as a necklace. This is a pendant. Again, sterling silver. I, I forged the chain. So I do the silversmithing as well. I do. <laughs> I do. You know, and I come to silversmithing not from um, a trained background, but more out of necessity. So I come up with these designs, and I want to create them, and I have enough skills to make them. And if I run into a stumbling block, then I just make some phone calls and um, try to solve it on my own. This one's 18 karat. Again, this is a pendant. It's a bead set into a bead set in uh, 18 karat Very gold. reminiscent of a, of a uh, crab. <laughs> yes, like. and this one's quite long. It, it, the bead that I had just picked up and explained that I was inspired by the African uh, granite beads, this one is almost four inches tall, and it's a lapel pin. And the bead is sliced in half. It's either sliced in half or I grind half of it away in order to set it like a stone in the silver. Earrings. 
Again, earrings. Just a smaller scale of what I'm doing on a large scale. And then the candlesticks, like the one that I have here. And then these are the inspiration, along with the teapot, for the objects that I want to make in the future. So being part of uh, the residency program at Corning, I was there for a month, and they gave me the facility to do anything that I wanted. It was just such a great opportunity to work and experiment. And then these are the pieces that I want to work on, combining the lamp working, the flame working, and the lost wax casting, and the metal all in new pieces. Are there different techniques that you, that you haven't used in creating what is here that you put into, a, into work when you start creating larger objects such as the such a candlestick or a teapot? I mm -hmm. mean, you, one would think of a teapot as being something, that, an object that's blown. Right. Is that a blown object? It is or? not a blown object. It's a cast. It's, it, when I say cast, I mean the lost wax casting, uh -huh. but it's this process that I just described. And the teapot is... Um, it's the idea of a teapot. It doesn't really function, but there is a space that you can open up and it has a little box. So basically it's a box or a special precious container that looks like a teapot. That's fascinating. And then these will be goblets or chalices that you might not use, but they have that feeling of a goblet or an important chalice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yes. a container, the idea of a precious container. But you've been able to create functional mm -hmm. art as well as uh, adornment, so that right. we have necklaces and rings, mm -hmm. and, uh, but the functional art also comes into play when you start creating these boxes or such as this right. particular piece there. Yeah. yeah. And the bronze is, you know, the candlesticks are incredibly durable and useful, so that is something that, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can use the candlesticks. Are you forging this as well? I carve that in wax. And then I have a foundry that will cast it in bronze for me. And then I do the patina and then any of the finish work that so I do. So you're doing, you're doing bronze casting as well as glass work, as well as silversmithing, yes. as well as, is there something you don't do? <laughs> I just learned how to use a snowblower yesterday. So. <laughs> I, know nothing, I know nothing about snowblowing. As a matter of fact, the guy next door says, I'll do it, I'll do yeah, it. Right, perfect. Right. Yeah, and I said, fine, whatever you, whatever you want. Um, you have a distinction that, that uh, I think a, a lot of artists could be very envious of, which is to have an association with the S Smithsonian Institution. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? Um, I was selected to be part of an exhibition, a four-person exhibition of emerging artists. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of, the, well, I could say emerging artists, but it was people that had been working for several years that maybe didn't have museum notoriety. So I was selected by the curator at the time to be part of this exhibition. And there was a jeweler, a tapestry maker, and a basket weaver, and myself, who were in the exhibition. And from that exhibition, they um, acquisitioned one of my pieces for permanent collection. So it's on display. It is, well, as in museums, sometimes they're not on sometimes display. They're held in the <laughs> I believe yeah. I'm in one of the drawers, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a um, piece at the Corning Museum of Glass that they oh. own and that is on display right now in a special exhibition they're having. What a prestigious oh. sense. It it. It, I went to see the exhibition just a couple months ago, and I was looking through the case, and uh, they have this uh, chronological story of glass and beads. So they begin it back in Egyptian times. And I was very scholarly, and I was looking through the timeline. And when we got to 20th century modern, there's a, one of my beads represents modern bead making. And I was sort of shocked to see it there in the case. It was very exciting. <laughs> That's something that we, we, we didn't talk about at the beginning, and, and we're getting close to uh, not having enough time to yeah. finish out the discussion. But can you give us kind of a chronology of the history? I mean, what you're doing here, the type of, when did this type of bead work come into beginning in the timeline of, of history? You're talking they, about the, the early days. Early days. So let's say 40,000 years ago, beads, um, shells, and stones, you know, holes were created in objects, yeah. and those were beads. But um, glass beads go back to Egyptian times. Uh, and I own in my own collection some Roman beads from about 100 AD, uh, which are exciting. And they're really intricate. They're beautiful. 
They're very well made. Now they certainly didn't have torches. What they did is they created a, like a beehive oven. Okay. So like a little volcano. Yeah. And on the top of that volcano was a lot of heat. And you can work right on the top of that um, as if it were a torch. So how did the glass come about? I mean, they're not going to have... Glass what came about from sand. So melting sand and ash. So sand is silica mm -hmm. and ash together can create glass. Glass was a big um, commodity in um, the um, Mediterranean area mm -hmm. at the time. It was mm -hmm. valued like gold. People bought and sold glass. And what does the ash contribute to the process of melting? You know, I'm not completely the scientist because I don't melt my own glass mm -hmm. to create the elements and the color. Mm -hmm. All the glass that I purchase, 90% of it comes from Venice and Italy that's already created. Wow. And then I use it here to create the... It's a, it's a fascinating thing. When I was in grade school, they started talking to me about how glass came from sand. Yeah. Makes no sense to me at all. Soda and sand and lime and... Mm -hmm. And, and who in the world ever discovered or thought about putting all these things there together great, to create a... There are great stories about that, that you don't know if they're really true, but you know, in the sense that if you've ever been to a um, outdoor campsite, and after the campsite, there's always things that are inside the, the coals that have melted at the time. Yeah. And you know, there are people who say that back in the day, you know, there was sand in there, and the sand got very, very hot, and then afterwards you had these funny black chunks of this beautiful material that would shear off and almost look like stone. That was mm. glass. Mm. That's fascinating. Mm. Just, that's, that that's, <laughs> boggles my mind, the, 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 what is really the chemistry of, right. of nature mm -hmm. that creates that sort of thing. And now the hunt for glass artists is color. Like how can we create, you know, if we put in elements, if we put in cobalt, we can create cobalt color. If we put in iron, we can create green. If we put in um, you know, silver, if you put in gold, you can cre create fabulous colors. And this is all discovered by experimentation. Exactly. By yep. Just simply right. trying something, trying putting something out. in there and seeing what you get out mm -hmm. of it. And now the process is combining those into pieces of art. Right, right. That's fascinating. Is this um, the, 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 the smoothness, the texture of it, and the simplicity of the artwork itself. I mean, if, if, I, if I say simplicity, I'm looking at this particular one in the center. But if we look at the two of them combined or, or against each other, there is simplicity, and yet there is very intricate detail to the work itself. How did you discover hmm. how to accomplish that? I think... I. I've I mean, I, I believe that everybody has an innate desire for either color or simplicity or rough objects or smooth objects. There's something very primal inside of us all. The thing that I am always drawn to is intricate detail. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I look for it. My eye looks for it at all, all times. But I love intricate details spread over very simple forms. So the fact that this bead is very simple and smooth, technically to make this bead it's very difficult because of that disc shape. So I have to create a lot of effort to make that bead as simple as it is mm -hmm. on the surface and then afterwards go in there with all that detail. And work that through. And with, work that through, keeping that form incredibly smooth. With particular tools that are of the... Very few tools, but the, one of the tools I use for this smoothing that is a very small um, graphite paddle. So a little stick with a tiny little piece of graphite that I use to smooth it. To key, okay, gotcha, mm -hmm. gotcha. This is absolutely fascinating. Thank and you. it's beautiful, beautiful work. And no surprise at all that you received the Spotlight Award for for art and glasses. Christina Logan, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your craft and your passion with us. We appreciate it. You're very welcome. I enjoyed talking to you. And thank you, as always, for being with us uh, on Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Bill Humphreys. We'll be back again next week, so be sure and join us then, won't you? Thanks.